Welcome, Dave. Over to you. I'll take a seat. Thank you, Steve. So I want to uh, ask uh, my panelists to come up here. Um, uh, first, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Phil Bofar. Phil, come on up. And uh, 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 Phil is the uh, nice. was a senior researcher and developer at Mangar University. Yeah. I didn't know you were yeah. from Maine. Uh, <laughs> And uh, moved to the Institute of uh, Educational Cybernetics at Bolton University. And uh, there, uh, he created the Archimate uh, modeling tool called Archie, which probably many of you have used. And uh, he's been curating developing of that independently and working with the open group to define next generation, define, implement, and execute the next generation of the Archimate exchange file format. So Phil, thank you. OK. Uh, next. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll just bring everybody up. Uh, John Stow is, uh, is a senior software architect at uh, JHNA Inc. And uh, they're an a organization that contracts to the U.S. Army Future Vertical Lift Program. And uh, they're software engineering director in Huntsville, Alabama. And uh, he has a very interesting example of an executable standard in support of the, uh, the uh, future airborne capability environment uh, face standard that's uh, uh, been produced by the Open Group. And third, uh, Carl Schottmeyer, who is uh, getting mic'd up here, so I'll stretch out his uh, intro here. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll go for my intro and then we'll, we'll go on, Carl. So uh, he's an independent consultant specializing in IT management standards and solutions. Uh, he's a fellow of the, uh, the DMTF and our, uh, the Open Group's liaison to the DMTF and the member of the SNIA working group uh, and works to keep both specifications in, in sync. And uh, uh, one of his contributions in the executable standards area has been leading a major open source project that we do called Open Pegasus. And they'll all tell you more about those. I want to give a quick intro to frame some of this. We've heard from Andras and Steve about the need for executable standards. And um, so I want to put that a little bit in the open group context. So I'm going to start with a simple question. Why are you here? Why are you here at the Open Group? You might be here to learn about industry direction and trends. You might be here to discuss that industry direction and trends and try to, to guide it and shape it. You might be here to network with your peers, very valuable part of what goes on at the Open Group. And you might be doing the hard work of creating those, the underlying standards that are kind of the, the fuel of the, uh, the engine of uh, what we do here. And also backing that up with creation of certification programs. These are all things that bring people to the open group. If you put it all together, what are we really about? And we're really here to make standards work. The Open Group is an organization that solves business problems through the use of open standards. And as Andras pointed out, we've, we've had both. Um, oops, we've had uh, started with uh, both the organizations formed out of uh, two organizations, one of which was focused towards written standards, one of which was focused towards delivery of standards in the form of code, and both of these are valuable in the actual achievement of standards adopted in the marketplace. People conflate, and I think Steve mentioned this earlier, people often conflate you know, what open means. And I've heard people say open standards and open source like it's all one word, right? Um, there are some differences. The definition of open is a little bit different between the two. I'll let you read these, um, you know, what an open standard is, specification for behavior, and one of the key parts of the open standards world is our attention to process, the openness and transparency of our processes and the, the auditability of that. And that's, that due process is something that all of you have experienced working in the open group standards process. And a very important point here is that there is not a bar to people doing impl independent implementations of those standards. In the open source world, um, the focus is on the software. Um, it's, it's really about uh, openness of, of use. 
that uh, you know there's licenses and this is the Wikipedia definition and also the definition off of uh, the open source licensing site. Uh, the copyright holder provides the right to uh, you know look at and change and adapt the software uh, to to anyone and for any purpose. Right, so it's openness of use there. Similar in concept to uh, you know, no bar to independent implementation. And the third one I want to introduce here, because it's actually important for the open group, is uh, openness of data models, that there are, we have executable structures that allow exchange of information, support our vision of boundaryless information flow. And all of these <coughs> approaches are actually useful in actually having the standards impact the marketplace. As Steve mentioned, we've got a long history of this. I have to use my prop here if I can juggle the microphone. I brought, I dug this one out from a long time ago. DCE developers kit. And this is something where uh, when we were creating DCE, we recognized that a key part of it was getting people to actually adopt the code. And so we put out this early, early access developers kit. And uh, DCE is kind of passed in time, but it's a reminder that we've got deep roots in this area. So that just shows you that I've been around for a long time. I'm going to talk, uh, introduce my panel, who are going to talk about some uh, current activities in executable standards. I've, I've introduced them already. Phil Bovar uh, for the uh, Archie tool for the ArcMate standard, uh, John Stau for um, the uh, FACE example, and Carl Schottmeyer for the uh, DMTF SIM standard. So, uh, Phil, over to you. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Um, how do I just press uh, it's, it? It's uh, press the, the arrow. Okay. Just don't press the bottom one. Okay. okay. Keep going. I'm here. All right. Okay. okay. Good morning. Yeah. Um, so, um, as Dave said, open, open source, um, open standards. And I'm probably known as the Archie guy. And somebody called me Archie yesterday, actually. My name's Phil. But, um, and the thing that I've been doing for the last six years has been making a piece of open source software specifically to model uh, the Archimate language. Um, so this morning what I want to do is tell you a little bit about a brief history of Archie and where it came from and then talk about its adoption and possibly how it has affected the uptake of Archimate globally. So two questions to start with. What is Archie? And how does it relate to the adoption of Archimate, the modeling language? So basically, simply, Archie is software. Archie is um, cross-platform client software. It works on Windows, Linux, Mac. Uh, you can download it for free. The source code is available for free. Um, and it just hits the spot where you can start modeling with Archimate very easily. We talk about low barrier to entry. The low barrier here is it's, it's free, and you can just get it and start working with it. Um, and we have, uh, well, I've set up a website, um, user forums, built up a whole kind of ecosystem around the tool, and just make sure that I keep getting it out there, getting the word out, and uh, people start using it, and just get going with, with Archimate easily. So also, Archie is a way of doing things as well. It's not just about um, producing software and writing lines of code. Um, we want to promote um, a philosophy that says, this is open source. It's cross-platform. We want to keep it free. We want to keep it accessible for everyone. We, we want to make it easy, working out the box. Um, th that phrase, I liked the difference between open source and what was the other phrase? Open plus, what was being mentioned just previously. I, I like that idea that you don't have to, I mean, a lot of some open source projects, or some open source projects, consist of you know, going to get the code and pulling this piece together and maybe compiling it. And maybe it doesn't work properly. My strong belief is that that's not necessary. You need to make something that's a product, and I keep emphasizing product here, that you're not just writing lines of code, that you're actually producing something that needs to ha express care and attention and getting people on your side, and getting people to like what you do and want to extend what you do. Um, so in that sense, um, I also say that Archie is a driver for change because it gets people on board with open standards, open source, and gets 
and gets people uh, contributing back, opening conversations between um, all the stakeholders. So quick history, uh, in 2010, what happened was in UK higher education, which is where I come from in a previous life, there was a project funded by uh, a UK organization, JISC, whereby they wanted to look at enterprise architecture in universities and start people, start the ball rolling as far as uh, modeling is concerned. And they wanted uh, to keep going with the philosophy of open source um, being funded by public funds in UK edu edu education. And so they had some money to um, pay me to write a proof of concept um, tool because I'd been working for the previous uh, 12 years at that time <coughs> developing open source tools from, for um, different reasons um, to do with interoperability standards using uh, the Eclipse uh, cross-platform uh, tool set. So in June 2010, I, summer 2010, so six years ago, I bought out version 1.0 of Archie. And it was billed as a, a low cost to entry solution to users who may be making their first steps in the Archimate modeling language. And um, the initial uptake was uh, within the UK higher education sector, uh, specifically targeted to, to that group. But um, here's the thing. I didn't need to um, advertise anything. I didn't need a marketing team because uh, within um, a relatively short time, a few months, weeks even, word got out that here's this free tool and there's a big growing buzz around Archimate and people could just go and get it. And uh, it, it became like a, a bit of a wild animal actually because <laughs> um, I was starting to get emails from large insurance, American insurance companies and uh, other individuals, students, trainers. Trainers started to use it. Um, I could mention lots of big names um, who use it. I won't, um, uh, but I, we're, we're, getting, we're gathering stories about different um, users and why they're using it. Um, it's been downloaded since 2010 lots of times, plenty of times, it's ubiquitous. It's three to 4,000 downloads a month, every month. That's a lot of users. I mean, even, that's Google Analytics. Even if you cut that figure down in half, or less than half, it's still a lot. So it's out there. I mean, people ask me, who uses Archie? And I sometimes wonder if it'd be easier to say who doesn't use it. Because it's used for itself, and sometimes it's also used I mean, to go on to other tools, because it doesn't provide all the solutions at this stage. It, uh, it, can, it can open the door. If you want to use other tools that do the job, um, maybe they have more features, that's fine. You can, you know, that's, that's a good use case. Get the ball rolling, get you using Archimate. Get in there, get going with it, see if it's for you. Um, and if you want to go on to some of the other proprietary tools, great, if you can you know, if you're set up for that. So what I want to say is that Arch, Ar, Archie has been, uh, I think, a real major driver for the adoption of the Archimate standard. And it has a global adoption as well, because there are, there are certain countries, I mean, Russia, for example, I'm, I think it opened the door to them because they, they took it and um, the university in Moscow translated it into Russian, Archie into Russian. And they have a whole cohort of users who just use it um, and model away. And I'm not sure if that would have happened if we hadn't had an open source solution available. So many users are using it, um, used by large organizations, individuals, trainers, students. And as I say, low cost, ent well, it's low cost is, is free. So in conclusion then, um, Archie, Archimate working together I've been working with the Open Group the past few years, um, working on the Archimate Exchange format. That's another thing associated with Archie, working with all the different users, getting feedback, getting some great stories, opening doors. And one thing that I think we could take this forward with is building an open platform build on the core of Eclipse and Archie and do a whole lot more interesting stuff with, with the whole modeling world and EA world. So 
I'm, I'm really excited about the future with Archie and Archimate. Great. Okay, I'm done. Thank you very much, Phil. Rem <laughs> yeah, just a reminder for folks, write down your questions on cards. Uh, people will bring them up and we'll take them all at the end. I want to make sure we get through everybody. So let me pass the baton to uh, John, who will talk about face and balsa. All right, thank you. So I, I came from a development background after I got out of the Air Force, and uh, one of the one of the first things that I I learned how to do was to program databases. So uh, if any any database developers in the room, um, anybody know where you can go get some code for how to make a database connection? All right, one of about a hundred different places you could go. Right? What about uh, what about if you're doing a web portal? You're, you're going to go develop a web portal, so you'd like to find some examples of how people have done that in the past. You, you, you've got some ideas in mind of where you might be able to go, maybe even some textbooks that come with a CD in the back, it, old school, right? And you, you were able to get the examples that the instructor used in writing the book for how you can begin the implementation of a web portal, how you could begin the implementation of a database application of some kind. So the actually, the most important part of my presentation is right on the first slide, it's not my name, it's that little green box down at the bottom that says unlimited distribution. So I work for the Army now as a contractor on future vertical lift. And so I'm gonna ask the same question I asked uh, the previous two times, only I'm gonna ask it with, a, with a different context. How many of you know where you can go get the source code to begin the implementation of an aircraft transponder? That, that becomes a different challenge all of a sudden. And so that unlimited distribution statement is critical to what we're doing inside of the FACE Consortium because you don't achieve security through obscurity. You don't try and take a platform and make it secure by hiding how the platform is built from everybody. Now there, there is an important aspect of protecting intellectual property and protecting secrets and, and things that need to be hidden, but you don't do it through hiding the interfaces and the construction and the architectural patterns. And so the FACE Consortium started with the understanding that aircraft costs were rising as these were becoming more and more digital platforms. And so you wanted to have a standardized way in which you could build aircraft architectures and ensure that those aircraft architectures could be openly competed. I, I want the ability to produce a new aircraft transponder and therefore I want all of the companies who build aircraft transponders to be able to compete on this so what is the standard by which I will say you can build the aircraft transponder and as long as it conforms to the FACE technical standard, I at least know that the interfaces are not proprietary. So it's a layered architectural standard with five segments uh, and a data model that goes along because now that I have the various segments of the architecture, I also need to know what data moves along that and how I can consume the data as a producer or a consumer, a publisher or a subscriber of the standard. So the FACE Consortium started off uh, with the idea of building the technical standard, but very important to that, we had a business environment that was not used to open standards in this way, so the business guidance going along with the, the technical standard was an important milestone for the FACE Consortium. And we looked to the open group and their experience for uh, being able to assemble the, the various different parties, government, industry, academia, to have a very successful standards body producing both the technical standard and the business guidance for how to consume that standard. But then there was also a verification and conformance process that was critical to uh, the, the concept of the FACE Consortium. And the reason that's important is because you can't have compliance. And if any of you have ever met Judy, I, d I don't know if Dave will also say it, Mike Kiki, some of the other folks that participate in the FACE Consortium. Compliance is a, is a very bad word in the FACE Consortium. And the reason is because if you're 98% compliant with the standard, those 2% non-compliant pieces provide the proprietary hooks that allow me to not compete the standard. So we are conformant. We, we are very much serious about verifying that someone meets the standard and ensuring that before they can say they're face conformant that they've gone through a verification process. So they've got business and technical working groups, very involved, Army, Navy, Air Force, uh, all of the major industry players, several academia uh, providers uh, are involved in these working groups helping to shape the standard and move it forward. Uh, we've released more than two versions. Version 2.1 is currently the released version and 3.0 is in development in an active and quickly moving standards body. So why, why does that matter for the presentation today? How does that have anything to do with open source or executable standards? Well, first of all, 
in the production of the FACE consortium and the FACE technical standard, the source code was not the primary focus. We're not trying to build a platform that is common for everyone. We're trying to build a standard on which platforms can be built. So we started with a question, and that is that how many of us have internal tribal knowledge where we know how the FACE technical standard works? We understand inside the consortium what we're trying to achieve. What about somebody who's never had any exposure to it? Now I work on Future Vertical Lift, uh, a program that many of the people who will be uh, spearheading the future designs that will be spearheading the innovations are right now in grade school uh, or elementary school. Some of them are, are just beginning their college career uh, before we will ever write the code for the Future Vertical Lift platform. Now that, that timeline is condensing, it's, it's coming very close. So we wanted to start with a study of could a college student have some exposure on their first exposure to the face technical standard and consume the basic concept of the face technical standard rather than being handed hundreds of pages of documentation and an introductory video do they understand at the core what this standard is all about five segments the ability to write something that's a published subscribe architecture can they can they do it so we built a, a challenge we called it the code challenge we put five students in a room that had they might have had some embedded software experience but they had no exposure uh, to face and we gave them the technical standard and a simple working example with the mindset of do the simplest thing that can possibly work can you build just one simple component with the examples that we've given you and we wanted to study this we wanted to learn and one of the things we were hoping to learn is that you're only new once, so if you, if you get that outsider perspective, don't dismiss it as, oh, they just don't understand. That outsider perspective is incredibly valuable because they're telling you something that you don't see on the inside when you, when you have the internal tribal knowledge of how your standard or how your application or how your company works. Someone from the outside gives you a valuable piece of perspective when they say, I don't understand. And so you're only new once, and then once somebody explains it to you, you're no longer new, now you're on the inside. So we wanted to gather that knowledge. And so we, we built a simple application framework plus a simple getting started guide with the focus on developer on-ramping. We, we gained so much value from that one exercise that we realized there's an ongoing pattern that, that we need to follow here, an ongoing process by which we are continuing to incorporate new feedback uh, and learn what our, uh, what our path of improvement is. So we started a, a group within the FACE Consortium called the Integration Workshop, focused on how do we make the standard more executable. And we built a, we took that code challenge software and built an actual application out of it called the Basic ADSB Lightweight Source Archetype. And in typical form, we came up with the acronym BALSA first and then figured out what it meant. Because, uh, I mean, we, we wanted it to be like a model airplane, BALSA wood, something that's not intended to be a real world replacement. That's very important, I'll come back to that. But it is a working example of how to use the face architecture. It, it covers the uh, IO services, the platform uh, specific services, and the portable component services, so three of the segments. And it also provides a transport service implementation. We know there are lots of vendors out there who produce operating systems and transport service mechanisms. So we, we just wanted to provide a simple, uh, it would rest on the POSIX interface that was already required and use a very simple transport so that people could envision, oh, well, that's not, that's not robust. Well, it's not supposed to be, but it follows the architectural pattern so that you can remove that transport services layer and put a robust commercially supported transport services in there and your application will still work. And that was our primary point. And so we, we uh, worked with uh, various industry players and, and with the Army and the Navy. And at our normal standards meeting, we conducted a face-to-face -face technical interchange meeting where we had a published papers track where people were able to use reference examples and they didn't have code that they could use in their papers before unless they went through an internal release process. So we wanted to have demonstrations of applications and the release of technical papers and it was very successful. That, that happened this February. So why ADSB? I won't spend a lot of time on the architecture of this, but I want to give a little background. Since I mentioned transponders before, I wanted to come back to that. We, we live in a defense industry, or I live in a defense industry, that is, that is very unique in its implementations. We, the FACE Consortium has ITAR restrictions. You have to be a U.S. person to participate. But we release the standard and publish it distribution A. So everything goes through that rigorous process. We're very careful about ensuring that when we publish the standard, that we've published it distribution A unlimited. But to participate, before it goes through that process, we have to do things on the inside. That creates the 
the problem of ensuring that we are not incorporating tribal knowledge or unique things into it. So we wanted to pick something for our demonstration example that was completely open so that everyone could, uh, could consume it, that anyone who was curious about it could, could simply Google how does this work, what is it, and they wouldn't have to understand something unique or defense specific. So we picked ADSB, um, and it's because it's an open, non-proprietary standard. It's something that everybody who, uh, who is familiar with aircraft in the general sense can look at ADSB and understand pretty much what it is. Oh, it's, it's position information. I'm flying. I want to know who you are and where you're at. I want to know where the ground station is. I want to know where the radio station is. And so position and reporting information, name, location, very, very simple, straightforward. And because it is two standards, uh, we want to show how you leverage one standard to consume the other. Uh, and it's used in both civil and, and defense we then could layer the face architecture showing how you can take that external standard and someone who simply says, oh, well, we, we build something that is conformant to the ADSB standard. That doesn't necessarily mean you can incorporate that into your software architecture because you have uh, the ADSB standard for how you're going to communicate with people, but the software architecture on your platform is how are you building those components. And so we, we divided up a very simple example. This is our Hello World example. It's, it's not quite as simple as Hello World in the avionics space. To, to demonstrate air traffic control, uh, the, the way that you would get position information from various sensors, the way that you would communicate with the operating system, and how you would move the, uh, the application forward. We had primary goals. Our primary goal in this was to lower the barrier to entry for new technical individuals who are coming to face for the very first time. We wanted to build something that was deliberately simple. Now, a Hello World example is too simple for what we wanted to do. It, it, it provided no value. So we had to raise the bar up to show how could I build something that was equivalent to the Hello World example that was the simplest possible use case that we could come up with that consumed the entire face technical standard. We had a secondary goal in this, and, and we decided that that was actually an internal and an external secondary goal. Internally, we wanted to provide a long-term training pattern for the example of that code for how we can describe certain technical challenges. In other words, how can we use this example so that somebody who's writing a particular portion of the standard who needs a sample code, to uh, just, a, just a couple of lines of code to stick into the standard so that they can show how you might do this, where are they going to get that code, and, and will it work, and is it ever maintained, and who's responsible for making sure that that code looks like the rest of the code in other parts of the standard. So we wanted an internal training pattern that could be used. And then also an external goal, we wanted to provide a starting point so that vendors could do the same thing. When they publish their application and they have to write their Hello World example so that they can include it in their SDK or in their tool that says build new face component. How are they going to get a starting point that everybody's familiar with? And so we realized there was, there was long-term value in this. And, and while it's not very meaningful and you know, it's just a picture of a Raspberry Pi, for us it was very important because avionics are extremely expensive. So developers, especially if it's a small startup company, which we want to inspire innovation. We want people to build software companies because they have an idea for an application that they can sell to the defense industry. And, and the barrier to entry is so high for that because a piece of avionics hardware is very expensive. And besides, if I buy a piece of avionics hardware, how do I know it's going to be the piece of avionics hardware that your platform is going to use? Hardware independence was extremely important to the software development concept. So we demonstrated that we could run this application on a Raspberry Pi. So we've lowered the barrier to entry for the development of avionics software down to something that literally a college student with an idea for an avionics software application can build. That doesn't mean it's simple, it means it's accessible. It's not about open source. We weren't building something that becomes the open source platform for all future vertical lift. We're not trying to say that the future replacement for some military helicopter is going to be running open source software. That is not the point. If you take that away, you haven't heard anything that I've said. The point is that we have an open standard so that we can replace upgrade, reuse the valuable investments that we've made in our avionics infrastructure. The code provides an example. It expands training and implementation. It shows us how we can do integration in an open space where I have something that I want to integrate with something that you've built. 
My thing and your thing are both proprietary to us. But that space in the middle where we integrate, that's open. And we, we need to make sure that we have more than just a little bit of code. It's open documentation. It's open training. It's open examples and prototyping. So internally, that's useful for the consortium as we're working together, but externally it's also useful for aligning face with other standards. We were able to take that open source example and use it because it is distribution A with other countries who are developing open standards for their defense industries and the United States with our ITAR concerns can't release our code. But now that we have this distribution A example, we can talk about something that we, that's tangible, that we can see. And so we've had an opportunity for standards alignment with other US-based standards, but also with international standards. We've seen it adopted in that tooling and demonstration example so that vendors have actually used that, that open source example of the code, the executable portion of our standard, that they can now take that and put it into their, into their tool so that that new reference example can come with something that they didn't have to write and that they don't have to explain. It, it's part of the ecosystem. And then finally, we, we've shown at least a couple of times internally, I, I don't have much that I can show you on this right now because it's, it's rapidly moving, but it's also, uh, it's also for the purpose of internal uh, risk driving, uh, driving down internal risk where a vendor who has a proprietary internal solution keeps their proprietary software on the other side of the open interface, on their side of the open interface. We don't want to know what's in that black box. We really don't. We want to purchase the black box, but we want to demonstrate that it can interoperate and be used in an open way. Well, how can we do that? Well, well, very simply, if somebody builds a commercial transponder, you can take the ATC component out of our little ADSB example, put yours in there, and if it works correctly and it publishes and subscribes the data correctly, we don't have to know what's in the black box to still achieve openness. And finally, we wanted to prove that we could eat our own dog food. We wanted to walk through the entire face verification and conformance process, which meant that we're, we don't have the, the, the bad legacy that open source software often contains, and that is that consume it at your own risk. There is no documentation, and if you can't figure it out, good luck. What we wanted to do is be able to say, here's how you actually get software verified and conformant to the face technical standard, which means that all the documentation for the software design in our relatively simple example, our conformance verification matrix, passing the automated tests, that all of those things were provided as well. So it's not just about open source, it's about demonstrating the openness of the standard as a whole. Thanks. Thank you very much, John. Carl? I'm going to go over and hide behind the podium <laughs> and protect myself. <laughs> well, that's another reason, so I don't fall off the front. <laughs> right, my name is Carl Schopmeyer. Um, I'm going to. Oh, probably need you this morning. I didn't, okay. Um, I didn't think I did. Good. Uh, in, in about three sentences, <clears throat> I'm one of the two people that started an open source project for, within the open group 15 years ago. We called it Open Pegasus for no particularly good reason. It was actually a solution to what at that time was a real problem. I was chair of the uh, management forum at the time, and, the, and in looking at the issues and in, in trying to manage IT, the first one it came up with, uh, there's absolutely no common infrastructure for managing IT. It was a, a world of vertical silos with everybody's clients, everybody's uh, application uh, tools, everybody's own interfaces, etc. And so one of the things we felt was important was some sort of a common infrastructure. The Open Group was not developing one at the time. There was a, parent, a partner organization known as the DMTF that was developing one, but <clears throat> what they were doing was producing what we at the time felt was a paper tiger. Lots of specs and no implementation. So two of us in a fit went off and started what not but later became Open Pegasus. Okay? Um, I'm going to introduce the DMTF and CINEA for just a minute since I used the words throughout the presentation, but you know, don't, don't get carried away with them. Uh, the DMTF has a whole series of specification to define common system management infrastructure, including the concepts of models, the models themselves, 
the physical uh, representation of those models in terms of classes that you can implement in management servers, a multitude of different protocols because every time somebody wrote a, defined a protocol for management, somebody came up with a <clears throat> new set of technology that demanded another protocol. So you started with binary, then you had to have the XML protocols, then you, oh wait a minute, then you had to have the REST-based protocols, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they're built into this. And then a whole set of specifications that represent domains of management. The major domains they have now is managing servers, managing storage, et cetera, but under that there's lots of subdomains for managing particular parts. There's about 100 plus specifications in the entire environment right now. And the goal was to manage things like servers, storage, et cetera. Uh, today, this whole, this whole set of technologies is supported by both proprietary and open source implementations. Open Pegasus is one of those core open source implementations. Uh, the actual standards are about 17 years old, and uh, Open Pegasus, I hate to say it, is about 15 years old today. If you look over on the right, you'll see a list of implementations, of open source implementations, missing one because Microsoft actually did one. And uh, I, I just put colors on them. Red means dead, purple means life support, and green means it's still running. And the only reason I brought this up is because it shows you that um, even if you do open source, your chances of success are fairly limited also. Well, a lot of these projects got started, actually had real support when they got started, and then later folded their tent because they didn't develop the common support, the common mechanisms, so, so they spread into the industry. What is Open Pegasus? Open Pegasus was one of those open source implementations. It started almost by accident by two people uh, with the intention of providing initially a prototype for those specifications and it grew to be a full production quality environment that implements the majority of those specifications, at least the infrastructure components of the specifications. It doesn't implement the actual management of particular devices, that's beyond the scope, but we provide the components of the infrastructure, client APIs, protocols, multiple protocol selection mechanisms, full servers, database support, query language support, all those things. It was developed under the auspices of the open group, but very much in conjunction with the DMTF because we were also contributing to and um, Working, working with and contributing to the DMTF specifications as they grew. Started in, two, in the year 2000 and it's still active. God, that means it's 15 years old now, that's scary. And we're still developing new versions. We'll come out with a new version this summer. Um, started by two people alone. We got interest from other groups. Eventually we probably had 10 developers working on the product, so it wasn't, it's not a small product. It's a, it's a significant effort. And uh, at this point, we're down to a couple of developers working with it because the level of changes, the level of changes go all the way down. But it's still the product itself is used by HP, by no, to a certain extent by IBM. I, we don't really know how many people use this thing because it's one of the problems in open source. You just don't really know who your user set is unless they come back and complain. Okay. Um, so we'll get into it in a minute. Uh, we picked a particular license for a reason. We picked the MIT license because our goal was not to protect our software, protect our rights to use our software. The goal of this project was to make these standards as available to people as possible and the way we felt, the best way we felt we could do it was to create software that was production quality that people could use without, without adding to the infrastructure cost, and so they concentrated their effort on their part of the problem, which was the interface with the things they were managing and what the clients are supposed to do. Over the years, <coughs> we've had both independent and corporate developers in it, companies like IBM, HP, um, Caldera, I can't even think, I think we had 10 companies at one point, uh, contributed heavily to it, um, and, then, and then we also had a number of independent developers who worked with it. We really have no idea how many users there are. But certainly we know how many, we know some the uses in the major corporations because they were also contributors, but there was, uh, over the years, there's lots of university were use, lots of experimental use, lots of people who took it off and forked it and used it and created other projects from it. Um, it was not just a product, it was a project. 
We've been through 15, 16 major versions now in, all, in these years with schedules, planning, I hate to say documentation because that's always a sore edge with anything open source, uh, but uh, repositories, history tracing, configuration management, an extensive bug system. To be honest, there's already 11,000, there's 11,000 bugs in the bug system, so there's been a lot of work and a lot of changes to it. Just as a throwaway in here, uh, it was created in the language C, C++ by and large, and it's still in those languages, and uh, we're, we're, well, so in the next slide or two, we're moving to add some more components to it, okay. I'm going to throw one other one in. It's a project called PyWeb, which has started from a different perception, but it implemented only the client portion of, the, of this whole set of infrastructures, largely because the languages we're using for the server are not the languages people wanted to write clients in. They want to write clients in scripting languages, in high-level languages, and C++ wasn't considered a high enough level language for them. <coughs> so, not. About 10 years ago, a young man went off and wrote PyWebM, and to be honest, the reason he wrote it was he wanted to get free attendance to a conference. And he'd figured out every year if he wrote something new, sent in the submission, they'd give him free entry to the conference. So we had all sorts of crud coming in every year. Um, SimServer and Haskell one year, SimServer and some other language in this, and then one year he picked PyWebM. Well, it kind of stuck, and other people developed it for a few years, then it rolled off into zero land, and then because a number of people recognized that it was important, we reconstructed it, and it is now, it's not part of Open Pegasus, but it's a parallel to it, except that this one is developed completely open source in the beginning on the public platforms, and Open Pegasus was developed under Open Group CVS, Open Group Bugzilla, Open Group tool sets that we had to construct ourselves. Also, this one uses the LGPL license, which is a, diff a significant difference. Um, this is also a thing that is compliant with the DMTF specifications. In fact, we're using it now in conjunction with Open Pegasus and gradually moving to it more and more for the tool set, the support set that you use with Open Pegasus. So why did we go to open source for these things? Um, at that time, specifications like the DMT, let's call them paper tigers. There was a lot of paper and no implementations or very limited implementations. The end result was people couldn't get started. The first thing you had to do was write an entire implementation before you could confirm anything. You couldn't test changes because people changed the specifications and it, it, it'd be years later before somebody would wake up and say, well, that's just broken. So this was a chance to create a, a, an, an environment that you could uses production, uses testing, available to anybody. Anybody could grab it, fork it, make changes to it. We accept the changes back into the common code through a process of review and voting. But other than that, it was, it was yours to use and do. So it gave us the chance to experiment with new spec state, with new specs, jumpstart users in the environment, provide an implementation that'll help resolve this paper specification issues, and um, provide something for implementations to test openly against. It was not a reference implementation. The DMTF didn't understand reference implementations this, at that time. And certainly, given that there were other implementations, nobody would have accepted this one as a reference implementation. So what did we learn from all this after 15 years? I think one of the big things we learned is, um, I'm trying to figure out how to put this. There's a huge number of open source projects out there, thousands of them. In Python alone, the Python repository has almost 90,000 open source projects, okay? But many, many of those are toys. Some started, never finished, some 200 words or less. It's, it, one of the problems with the open sources we see today is it's hard to decide what the quality of something is unless you can get references from other people, other groups, et cetera. So from our point of view, open source development is both a product and a project. You have to have a project with the constraints of a project, scheduling, planning, uh, source protection, version control, bug reporting, documentation, or it isn't gonna work. Okay. It has to have some schedules. 
Once people start using it, they have to be able to depend on the quality and the timing of your changes. If you agree to do something and people are using it, they're depending on what you're, what you're going to give them arriving at least somewhere in your schedule. And that's a big issue in open source because so much open support source is supported by part-time developers. And their primary activity elsewhere, and this is secondary. Uh, corporate interests are fickle. We had a lot of support from major corporations, except for the day they decided there was another project and we'd wake up and all 14 of them were gone one morning. And this happened over and over again. We woke up one morning and found out nobody in India, IBM India, would answer the phone. It took two weeks to figure it out. They didn't fire the, the entire team one day. Um, any development project needs something to tie it together. And I'm going to call that a champion. Somebody who's going to stay with it, live with it, keep the sense of direction, keep it moving through all the changes that are going to occur. Because unless it's just a one-time, one-off project, it's got to have continuity, growth, et cetera. Whether it's tied to a specification or by itself, it needs somebody who's going to continue to champion it. So, uh, fine, uh, my open source is not necessarily your open source. Um, we had some rules on our open source. It was a project. Uh, people paid a fee to become a member of this project but only a certain level. Anybody else could join, cooperate, use, contribute, et cetera. But we had a steering committee, and the steering committee set schedules. Therefore, to a whole bunch of people, we weren't open source. We had phone calls. Real open source doesn't have phone calls. Real open source, it turns out at that point, didn't even have schedules. You just come and work until somebody said, can we just release it? And so our being firm with schedules and projects meant our open source concepts were different than a lot of others. And we had a big conflict because we got some of the quote unquote real open source people involved with us, Caldera, and well that didn't last very long. We just, the two groups couldn't see how to even work together. Okay? Um, open source really is not free. Users think it's free. They want all the changes, they want all the quality for nothing, but somebody pays for it. Whether that's a volunteer group, a set of corporations, that's dependent on who you're, what you're trying to accomplish but it's not free for everybody. Um, tools are critical to making this stuff work. And when we got started, we were using individual pieces of tools and gluing them together ourselves. So we created projects to make CVS work. Open Group has a CVS server for this thing. It's been going on for years. Uh, we had a bug reporting system, came from Google called Bugzilla that we integrated, et cetera. And so we put a fair amount of time into making these things work. Documentation support, documentation tools, mechanisms to automate the documentation to a certain extent. Uh, we made it all work and it's there. We learned some things from that. First of all, given that where we are, we want to move ahead to a new set of stuff because over the last 15 years, one of the big areas of progress in open source has been the development tools. Tools like Git, continuous integration concepts, um, support facilities like GitHub, Bitbucket, these things, where all this stuff is relatively well integrated. I don't have to have my bug system. It's already there. I don't have to have my integration tools. They're there. I don't even have to have all my test platforms. On Pegasus, we had 15 or 20 test platforms, at least a number of them. I just, I sent it off to a magic world called Travis, which I still haven't figured out who's paying for. And all this stuff gets, every time we do an integration, it goes off and runs our set of tests for us. Okay. So all these changes now have not necessarily moved the emphasis, but brought open source up to the point where you can do serious project-oriented development with good quality, good, good support, and still depend, still do them on open source and depend on open source tools. And that's all I had for today. Did I cut us down a little bit? No, oh, we're down to 12 much. Good job. Good job. Well, I want to I want to thank my panelists, Phil, John, and Carl. Uh, we do have uh, managed to keep a few minutes left for questions from the audience. I want to start by making some observations. It's really insightful stuff. Um, first, I hope this dispels the rumor that there is any barrier to adding executable standards to the work you do in the forums of the open group. We've got three good examples here um, of you know, varying heritage 
Um, you've seen the common themes that uh, that kind of work can do of um, you know, allowing easy entry into the standard, uh, lowering the barrier not only for organizations getting started, but even uh, individuals getting started. I, I really liked your point, John, about you know, the people who are going to be writing some of this code are still in grade school. Yeah. And you know, these days, you know, what's coding is the new literacy, right? And that, that's being pushed down. So giving them access is a real head start for adoption of your results. Um, the other one is the platform for innovation, right? That uh, it's not open source as a product, but it's open source that allows other people to build on top of it or test something. You know, you give the face example, you give the Archie examples. Uh, certainly, that's been a driver in um, you know uh, the the open sim stuff as well to uh, to to bring that up. Um, and the third point, which uh, you know I hadn't really thought of is um, you know, we quite often talk about the open group as a good enduring home for standards activities. Well, it can be an enduring home for, uh, for the open source and executable activities as well. So it's probably an area where we need to um, dust off our infrastructure a bit, uh, Carl, uh, but certainly something we'd be willing to do if people want to take advantage of that. So uh, great stuff. Um, I got some questions from the audience here. Um, good news is I don't have to use any of my seed <coughs> questions. Um, we got a couple of questions here that, uh, you know, one to uh, Phil, you know, would if you had been not been paid, would Archie have been made? And, and by the way, thank you for uh, Archie and and uh, for uh, uh, John. Uh, you know, it was also a budgeted program to create an executable standard. Uh, and a similar question for Carl. Well, I think everybody likes to be paid, but I guess the, uh, the, the broader question here is, you know, is there anything about uh, the funding models for how things go on, not only to get them started, because as Carl noted, that changes a lot over time, but how do we keep it going? And, and particularly, Phil, and what I want to direct to you is, you know, what's it going to take to keep it in sync with the standard? That's a good question. Um, I honestly don't have the answer at this time. When Archie first started, we had project funding and um, there was enough funding to pay me initially for six months and that was great. Um, and then because it was successful at that time, they found some more funding just to keep me going for, I think, another couple of years. And so I, I just had free reign and I could just keep going. And that stopped in uh, 2013 um, when I moved on from the university. and. I've been uh, spending a lot of my time um, continuing and maintaining um, Archie, which involves, uh, as we heard earlier, things like setting up continuous integration, Travis Git, staying up to speed with GitHub, and there's so much you can do uh, out of goodwill. But there does come a point where you become aware of a disparity between the, the enormous amount of users who use it and are actually getting good value out of it. And then you start to realize, in my case, well, um, I'm not getting any value out of it other than some kudos, maybe, which I can't eat kudos. So, um, <laughs> so it's a difficult situation now where we're, where we're at, where we're saying we've got a new um, version of the Archimate standard 3.0. And we need to do a lot more with it. So we're, we're at, in a position now where we, see, we need to think about sustainability and immediate funding. So it's kind of up in the air yeah. is to answer yeah. your question. Yeah, OK. It's a, an ongoing project. So again, the, the joint activity is a, a key to doing that. Carl? I'm yes, going to throw just one little side note in there. I think, um, huh. I can't even think of the name of it. Um, what is the core? Um, security standard, oh, open, SS, open SSL, okay. mm -hmm. that's a classic case of the question of funding. Yeah. It was depended on by the entire industry and when the heartbeat problem hit, they found there was one poor guy, I think he's sitting in Germany, trying to do all the support for himself, by himself, and nobody could figure out why we were so far behind. Mm -hmm. Now, at, when that all came out, support developed. Google started to support it. I think Apple threw some money in, but even that created conflict because instead of just instead of supporting him, they all went off and created competing versions. So it, it's not an easy question asking how you support it. And once people start getting something for free, it's really hard to figure out a way to get them to pay anything. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's, I think it was 
Yeah, but only after the embarrassment of finding out this poor guy was doing it all by himself. <laughs> John, John, any observations? Yeah, I think, I think one of the important things that we have an opportunity for uh, within uh, different forums and consortium uh, within the open group is to understand that problem uniquely and say if we want people to receive adoption for our standards that we all have some skin in the game, that we all have something at stake. Uh, and so volunteers, and, unless they are, are you know, um, uh, independently wealthy or, or able to live on, on meager incomes, uh, all have to eat you know, some, some form of their kudos. And so uh, when it comes to having executable standards, when it comes to supporting an open source initiative that provides value to everyone, it's important for us to recognize that that all needs to move forward. And because we have uh, standards bodies, we already have the collaboration mechanism in place. And, and if we don't leverage that, then we're missing something that we have value to bring to the open source world that, uh, that other people don't. Great point, John. Good. So uh, I want to move on to the, this uh, issue about, you know, what does open mean? Does it mean something different between open source and open standards? And it says, you know, open standards grant IP rights for others to build independent implementations, and open source grants IP rights to reuse the code, but uh, not necessarily to build independent implementations. And um, the examples on the stage all came from an open standards world. So the um, question was, how do you plan to resolve this, uh, you know, this joint view of, of uh, IP rights when attempting to do both at the same time? Uh, I guess the, the preliminary question is, has this been an obstacle to uh, either creation or adoption of, of what, uh, what you've produced? In my case, um, um, no, I can't think of any obstacles. I mean, we, we adopted um, at an early stage the MIT license, and I think you have this too, don't you? Yes. Yeah. Um, and what that means, it's um, basically anyone can take that code and do stuff with it and uh, make commercial stuff out of it if they want to do that. Or, but you know, the reality is different. Um, when you have a, a liberal license like that, it actually comes back. So it, it's good for everyone. And people don't run off and steal things and close things off with, um, with liberal licenses like that. And in reality, there are not really that many issues around IP either. In this game, people try to work together and make things work mm -hmm. between people. John, what, I, we, I have to confess, I don't remember what license you use for Boston. We we have a slightly interesting uh, situation with that because we we have a distribution process that that's part of the public release process for uh, the defense industry, uh, but it doesn't require licensing on the other side, so it has not been officially adopted by um, by anyone to put a license on. So it's distribution A unlicensed at this point. Um, and, and, and we had a different uh, problem associated with intellectual property which was a which was a uh, particular challenge in in our implementation. That is, that faces a layered approach, and so uh, Balsa is not a single application. Balsa is a series of executables that build an architecture, uh, and it's a simple architecture. It's an, it's an open stack as opposed to not trying to reuse the term, but it's an open stack of of applications, not one thing. So we want people to be able to replace components of that and show interoperability, uh, and and still hide them hide and protect their intellectual property. So, open problem for us. Okay, Carl. Uh, we picked MIT for a particular reason. There are almost no limitations. There's only one limitation. Don't take our license and copyright off the code, and we even found people violating that. But that was immaterial. That was relatively immaterial. You face them up and they clean up and put it back on. But um, at the same time, if you remember the other product, PyWeb, PyWebX, was actually done under LGPL for whatever reason. And by the way, one of the problems with licenses is don't ever try and change it once you've created one. God couldn't change most of these licenses because you have to get the permission of everybody who's contributed. And by the time you realize most projects start helter-skelter and you don't know who the original contributors are, you can almost never get enough, enough signatures to change it. But that's different because it lives in a slightly different world. In, Python, where there are tools that you can use LGBL and change it without actually changing it and use, import things and use them so that that license works well for that. But as far as have being a major hindrance, no, I don't really think that 
Picking the most liberal license got us what we wanted. Yeah. Anybody can use it, please go use it. Yeah. So yeah. really what I'm hearing here is that it's something to think about and you got to uh, work within the constraints of your, your development and legal environment if those are unique. But in general, we're not, there's no real big barrier here. It, so. Generally, I would say uh, once you understand there are certain limitations, you can't change it once you created it. Yeah. Uh, LPGL, APG, LPGL means inside corporations. If we'd done Pegasus under LTP, no corporation would have touched it yeah. because it yeah, right. meant a lot yeah. of internal modification. Yeah. Right. But Python stuff works very well under LGBL because it's a different, yeah. a different way of usage. So last question here. Uh, we're getting very short on time. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's... Uh, Somebody raised the point that interoperability is highly dependent on a common vocabulary at the data level. Uh, one thing that struck me uh, while we were preparing for this panel was that when we talk about executable standards, sometimes we talk about executable code, but actually we have executable models for data as well. And, and Phil, I know one of the key activities you've been involved mm -hmm. in is the Archimate exchange file yeah. format. And of course, uh, FACES, a, a big part of reuse is having a, a proper so. data model. Uh, can, and uh, um, Carl, there's probably dimensions to that that I haven't thought of. So uh, okay. I, let me ask, uh, um, you know, in terms of executable data, is that something that, or executable standards around uh, data exchange, is that something that um, uh, is different than considerations around executable standards in, in code? Ex who you? Who are you pointing at? <laughs> the, my panel. Uh, <laughs> who I'm, wants to start? I'm going to throw one piece in there. Okay. Um, one of the one of the issues you need to deal with there isn't is the fact that yeah it needs to be completely documented. If it's documented correctly, you solve a lot of problems. I was working through some code the other day, a whole set of classes and stuff, beautifully put together in Javadoc. Okay. So you get to a class that says this is the web and blah, blah, blah class. And the documentation says, this is the web and blah, blah, blah class. Well, you've gained nothing. Okay. <laughs> and the same thing as you worked your way down. And uh, if you go through some of these other projects, you'll see things are clearly documented. What, you know, what the model is, what the characteristics, what the goals, uh, what the typing is, things like that. And once you get those things, I think you solve a lot of these interoperability problems. I, I think that we're at the stage right now where uh, data interoperability is, is somewhat similar to the way that we're processing interoperability was 15 years ago. Um, and that if you're using the same tool chain, if you're using a consistent tool chain and you want to interoperate with someone else, you have reasonably good chance of success of getting data interoperability as well. Uh, but because we are trying to create an environment where um, we have independent tool chains and independent development shops that interoperate, and because we are concentrating so much instead of on silo-based or, or monolithic applications that are built, open standards just for the construction of that application are less important and less complicated than the exchange of data between them. Yeah, good. Thank you. Phil, any final comments? Not really. We're, I, I know we're out time but okay. just Good. you mentioned the Archimate exchange format I think it's a really good thing it's interoperability and it's getting people working together. Good. Well thank you. So uh, we are out of time here.